diving deep. Art Bell. <laughs> Let there be no mistake, I'm a huge Art Bell fan. When I first started listening to Coast to Coast AM, I was open-minded, in a liminal state, and seeking forbidden knowledge of sorts, so it's no surprise that I was drawn to the show, and its content did have an impact on me. It even eventually became a security blanket for a time. When everything was uncertain, one thing was, at 1 a.m., I could always turn on the radio and see what was happening in the high desert. I'm sure I'm not the only one who felt that way. But truthfully, I've been personally interested in many of the subjects covered on coast since as long as I can remember, as are many of my generation. I also know for a fact that my grandfather introduced me to Harry Houdini and P.T. Barnum when I was very young and impressionable. He was of the age to be mesmerized by these individuals firsthand. I'm still entranced by people of their ilk. The spirit to create something magical is alive and well. Just yesterday, my daughter and I were watching magician David Blaine float across the Arizona desert, holding a bouquet of multicolored balloons. Her spirits were lifted through this trick. Mine too. Houdini and Barnum would create an atmosphere of wonder and suspense. That's precisely what Art did with Coast to Coast AM every night. This video is intended as a recollection of a beloved show that I listened to over 20 years ago. I'll discuss how Art and his legendary radio program, Coast to Coast AM, intersected my life, transfixed my imagination, and the resulting pursuit to find a show suitable as a replacement for Coast Post Art. I was an avid listener to the program during its peak, 1996 through 2002, so this video will primarily focus on that period of time. Art Bell did make the magical scene possible, and I am grateful to Art for that. I'm always on the lookout for it to happen again. Art Bell, a unique American icon, a one of a kind for sure. When Art finally decided to leave Coast to Coast AM for good, I'm talking about the last and final retirement. In 2003, he handed over the keys to the Kingdom of Nye to George Nori. You know, he's a spitting image of a 1970s Giorgio Moroder. Oh, that's, that's why he got the job. I mean, any of the other guest hosts back then would have been better than him. I guess I'm still bitter. In fact, I'm still irritated that David Letterman didn't get Johnny Carson's spot when he left The Tonight Show. I'm a long grudge holder, I guess. At any rate, when Nori came on the scene, I bailed. His style and demeanor were drastically in contrast to Bell's charismatic showmanship. I'd occasionally try to catch a weekend show hosted by Art every now and then, but it just wasn't the same. That's the year I switched from radio to podcasts, from my leisure listening. I was also getting caught up with a couple of books I had acquired. Robert Anton Wilson's Prometheus Rising and Alan Watts's The Book back in 2003. So by seeking out podcasts that were tangentially related to Wilson and Watts, I stumbled onto some great podcasts that have withstood the test of time in my mind. As an aside, shortly after Wilson passed, I was scrolling through eBay and stumbled upon someone selling all the little knickknacks and tchotchkes from Raw's estate. I kicked myself later for not at least bidding on an item or two, but at the time I thought to myself, with all the esoteric avenues Raw explored, I wasn't entirely sure 
his previously owned items may be imbued with something I didn't want in my house. I certainly didn't want the equivalent to a Dybbuk box. Knowing what I know now of Raw, he'd find that amusing. I love listening to his lectures. His voice is very distinctive and sticks with you as you read his books. Other authors are like that for me. Charles Bukowski, for instance. After I listen to several hours of interviews and poetry recitations, I can actually hear his voice reading his words. It's very weird. You want some poems? Beg me. <laughs> With art no longer in the captain's chair of coast, I put myself on a diet of podcasts. Banal of America Audio, Radio Mysterioso, The Paracast. I really enjoyed the years David Viedney was co-hosting. In addition, the Paracast conversations with Alan Greenfield were always enjoyable. Recently, I saw Greenfield's involvement in the YouTube series Hellier. I found that a little curious. Greenfield has been known to be a prankster at times. His book Secret Cipher of the Euphonaut deals with some of the same territory Hellier was covering. Discussions on the Paracast with Jim Mosley were always interesting. He was another fun-loving trickster. I would also try to catch whatever iteration of broadcast Don Ecker was putting out at the time. A little piece of art-related gossip. According to Ecker, art modeled the format and style of Coast to Coast on a show Ecker was producing in the late 80s, early 90s, UFOs Tonight. His show does predate Art's switch from political talk to paranormal talk, so Ecker does have a point. There were other podcasts, too, that are no longer active, such as Out There, a podcast that Douglas Rushkoff was doing at the time, Ken Traversy, Kent Benkowski's podcast, and Adam Go Rightly's Untamed Dimensions, with a handful of great podcasts hosted by some very memorable personalities that was sufficient to fill a large, art-shaped void. What had originally compelled me to listen to Coast in the first place was honestly just seeking different perspectives on some of these esoteric subjects. The subjects that are usually not discussed in public, at least where I'm from. Keep in mind, this is during the time of a very early internet. So the large public forum Coast offered had the potential to allow many voices to be heard Additionally, I wanted to find out if there was a single shred of evidence supporting any of these claims. Alien abductions, cryptid encounters, shadow people, visitations, black-eyed kids literally at the door, you name it. Of course, there's never any real evidence to be found, only the account of a single individual. Now, in 2020, as I write this, something seems to have changed in the way the government is handling the release of some information in regards to naval incidences with UAPs or UFOs. US officials and naval intelligence have reportedly been tracking off-world technology in the sky, underwater, and in space in an ongoing effort to understand the nature of this seemingly intelligent object. Does somebody break and start on an entry accident, 14th in New York? This is an actual news story. I was always pretty certain that trying to get the government to disclose anything about the topic was a futile gesture. But ever since 2017, there has been a steady drip of information on the subject coming from government sources. Perhaps we are in for a big announcement in the future. There is also speculation that these UAPs are advanced aircraft being used by a branch of the armed services. In other words, our aircrafts. I do have a strong feeling that what will ultimately be revealed is that we, the United States, 
does in fact have a secret space program. I don't think they will ever disclose whether or not the tech was back engineered from off-world sources. They will simply claim that these advancements were due to good old-fashioned American ingenuity and they had to keep it secret for reasons of national security. The interjection of the term space force into the lexicon is most likely part of them laying the groundwork to begin bringing this dark space program into the light of day. A famous story in 2002, Gary McKinnon, a citizen of the UK, hacked Pentagon computers and discovered documents that listed names of non-terrestrial officers. McKinnon's story is a fascinating one and is still being played out. The U.S. continues to try to extradite him from the U.K. for sentencing in the U.S. In addition, back in 1991, Don Eckers' STS footage he presented on Larry King Live may be showing that same off-world technology being utilized. I don't know what is going on in our skies. I have a much more skeptical eye than I did 24 years ago. When I began listening to Coast to Coast AM in 1996, I have to admit, I had no idea about the cast of characters that would be peddling their wares across Coast to Coast AM's stage. Guess I should have known. It's a marketplace like anything else with advertising and sponsors. At the time, I was in X-Files mode. I wanted to believe. But as I listened to Coast, I began to see a pattern. Many times when a person is telling you they have all the answers, and many guests did, and still do on George Norrie's coast right now, they're telling you the only way you can retrieve their infinite wisdom is through buying their product. I've noticed a trait in many of these hucksters. They continue to talk incessantly, and they want to control, completely control the interview. It's as if they've totally convinced themselves of their own fabricated story, and now that story is the objective truth to them. As a result, they now feel compelled to convince you too. It is done in order to validate their own story to themselves, so they feel better and safe. That sounds familiar. After indulging in the world of Coast for all those years, perhaps I'm a little wiser about trusting content presented on a radio show that's considered entertainment, not news. It's one person's perspective being packaged as news. That can be very confusing for some people. But that's the point, right? Coast was not a news program, nor was it ever trying to be. The bottom line is, validate someone's claims for yourself. Charlatans and snake oil salesmen are everywhere. Be warned, right? I wanted to briefly speak to some of my favorite podcast hosts, Tim Banal and Greg Bishop. Banal and Bishop approach these subjects with eagerness to really uncover secrets of the unknown, blended with the grounded sensibility. Neither host has ever asked for money. Their shows are presented without commercials, and both podcasts are usually over two hours in length. These shows run purely on donations and the dedication of these hosts. Banal of America and Radio Misterioso have a huge backlog of shows too. Banal of America has been up and running for over 10 years close to 15 I think. He had taken a hiatus from his podcast in true Art Bell form, but now he's back in full swing. Also, in true Bell style, he's producing some fascinating new shows. Highly recommend this gent's cast. Bishop has written several books on the subject in this realm. Project Beta, his first book, is about a man, Paul Benowitz, who was psychologically manipulated by government agents after he unwittingly witnessed secret U.S. aircraft test flights. Benowitz mistook these aircraft for UFOs and began telling people. The government stepped in and basically Benowitz ended up in a psych ward for months. A fascinating story if you're unaware of it. Bishop has been active in the field since the 80s, writing books, publishing zines, the excluded middle, and has had his radio show, his podcast show, Radio Mysterioso, for years. Big fan of this guy too. Check him out. Coast.
coast just had so many discussions of topics I was already interested in, such as time travel, quantum mechanics, astronomy, archaeology, science fiction, fantasy, ancient astronauts, and Carl Sagan. As a kid, I also really loved horror movies. I couldn't wait to be freaked out. All these things coalesced for me in our show. Coast was much more than just a radio show. It had to have been one of the first to utilize an extensive website to enhance the show. The internet was new at the time, and only a few years earlier, I do remember actually seeing commercials advertising the internet. The World Wide Web is coming. Are you ready? I didn't have a computer at home at the time, so I relied on the library computers at the college I was going to. Instead of finishing papers, I'd pour over the Coast website. Art's wealth of knowledge of radio, broadcasting, and communications was vast, and it was always very entertaining to delve into anything radio with him. I had not previously been interested in the way broadcasting worked, but Art piqued my interest in the subject. His hobby as a boy turned into a career later in life. The man was all about radio, consumed his whole life. He had a gigantic radio broadcast antenna in his backyard after all. Art lived and breathed radio, and naturally, radio would come up as a topic quite often on the show, almost as much as the paranormal. Art's passion for radio was infectious. Back in 1996-97, I really got back into catching up on the sci-fi offerings. On TV. The latest Star Trek franchise, Voyager. Reruns of Next Generation. Quantum Leap and The X-Files. As I watched The X-Files, I began to wonder if any of the events portrayed on the show could actually be true. I read somewhere in a magazine, I think, that Chris Carter, the creator of the show, was privy to some government information and he was revealing some of it through the show's storylines. Alien smoking a cigarette. I also remember somewhere the character of Fox Mulder was loosely based on an actual FBI agent who presided over such a department. There have been several people over the years who have said Mulder was based on them. So, who knows? There were a few other bits of media that related to subjects covered extensively on Coast that seemed to stand out in my mind. Fire in the sky. Remember that one? This is actually really a terrifying film. I remember it leaving me with a very uneasy feeling. That would be the opposite of that Eagle song. I was previously aware of Travis Walton's story, most likely from a TV program, like Sightings or something, I'm sure. When the movie came out, I was very curious to see how a story like Walton's would translate on the big screen. It was intense. And I haven't seen it since the theater in 1993. To me, it is within reason to consider this case and others like it to be some type of psyops operation or field test of various clandestine technologies, a la the alien smoking a cigarette in an episode of X-Files. Walton's account has some similarities with other accounts like Cash Landrum, Rendlesham Forest, and even Betty and Barney Hill were all these government psyops. I was also reading Stephen Hawking's A Brief History of Time. His grasp of the physics of the universe gave me comfort. Sightings, that good old staple of paranormal media. This program was on for many, many seasons, so I caught a lot of episodes over the years. Prior to sightings, I'd watch all the other available programming on the paranormal through the 80s like, that's incredible real people and the granddaddy of them all in search of I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Time Life Books series Mysteries of the Unknown Art was like the radio equivalent to that book series I think the Cydonia region of Mars was fascinating to me in the early 90s I must have read a piece on the region in either Fate, Omni or another magazine any chance I had to access the early internet I would go to different online forums and read the conversations people were having about these subjects. Surely at the very least, the government has seen these structures in the photos that they took themselves. In my opinion, if you've seen the images, you can't mistake some of these structures in this region to be anything other than ancient constructed structures. Therefore, the government does know way more 
about this subject than we'll ever know. Dad, won't people know that Mars was once inhabited? I never felt the need to call into coast. Guess I just like being a fly on the wall or a bug on a keyboard. When looking into Cydonia, you almost certainly run into Dimitri and Molinar and their research and their extensive analysis of photos of that Martian region. You will also cross paths with one Hoagland has been a champion of Cydonia for decades. I would often read transcripts of Hoagland and Bell's conversations, even before I listened to the show. Come to think of it, the first show I tuned into, the guest was none other than Richard C. Frankly, there is so much photographic evidence of artifacts on Mars and the Moon, it's, it's, it really is laughable. Actually visible on untouched official NASA photos. The Moon is reported to have movement on the surface transient lunar phenomenon for decades perhaps centuries i initially came across the books of zachariah sitchin in the new age section of a book for million a book with such wildly different concepts of our beginning than i was taught in school or church basically a reimagining events described in the bible this book series did interrupt my operating system momentarily even as some of sitchin's translations of cuneiform are inaccurate. It's still a fascinating take on the origins of the human species. Again, I'm, I'm going to say this, and uh, I don't know how you all want to be disposed of when your time on Earth is gone. But graveyards don't sound too good to me. In terms of where I think I would like to go when my time comes. The local AM station that I was very familiar with during the day had different offerings at night. One of these programs was, of course, Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell. A friend mentioned to me in a conversation that she had listened to a crazy radio call-in show the previous night. She said that people were calling in to talk about encounters with vampires. Being familiar with Coast through Hoagland's site, I instantly knew that Coast to Coast AM was on my local station. That night I stayed up late, and at 1 AM, sure enough, I heard the theme from Midnight Express. <laughs> It's not like copyright infringement, me doing a Bobby, Bobby McFerrin impression of Midnight Express song, The Chase. Anywho. Back to that. Back to this. And for the next several years, I didn't miss a night. I followed the series of interviews with Hoagland, Dames, Reverend Malachi Martin, Monroe, Zachariah Sitchin, Terrence McKenna, Jim Mars, the Stevens, Bassett and Greer, Peter Davenport, George Knapp, John Lear, Dr. Lear, Abby Streamer, Al Padoff, Dean Radin, Stanton Friedman, Brad Steiger. If you go to the Art Bell archive, you just see how many, I mean, over, the, over the course of all those years, how many people he, inter he interviewed, it's, it's pretty cool. Anyhow, that's just a few of them. Future, few cherry picked. The varied offerings of subjects Coast covered was intriguing. Skinwalker Ranch. Bad Bad Markham. John Tinker. Indies. OBEs. Bigfoot Ghosts. The Afterlife. Remote Viewing. EVPs. Astral Projection. The Occult. Chupacabras. Mothman. And the list goes on and on. I was so hooked I even subscribed to the After Dark newsletter for, <laughs> for a year. And I bought the Fate magazine featuring... Good old Art. May Being the showman that he was, Art tricked me on a few occasions. According to some, Bell's willingness to play along in a hoax played a role in the deaths of the Heaven's Gate cult members. I had a telescope at the time of Hale Bob, and I saw it with my own eyes. In the spacecraft flying alongside the comet. Bell had been sent some photos of the comet 
with what appeared to be an anomalous object nearby. And he kind of ran with it. This claim was aired and discussed over the course of several shows. I found myself on more than one occasion getting really caught up in the show. Art had me on the hook at times. For example. I was listening when the alien in the freezer story broke. Not the farmer who was arrested for claiming to have a dead alien in his freezer in China, or the Russian freezer hoax, but Dr. Jonathan Reed hoax. I can remember having the episode on a cassette and playing it for a few friends before the book arrived. I was the only one excited about, about that story. It's clear now why Reed was so articulate and convincing with his story. He'd already written it down in the form of a book of fiction and basically used it as a script for his calls to Coast to Coast AM. I must have been willing to believe most anything at the time. I was in the process of shedding some previously long-held beliefs and notions. Contrails and chemtrails were a huge topic on the show during the late 90s. I found myself wrapped up in that one too. I don't hear people talking much about it anymore. It must have been replaced by a million other conspiracy theories instead. There is no doubt that on certain days in different areas of the country, planes flying at high altitude, laying a grid of trails that linger for hours, is a real thing. I've personally observed these events numerous times in Georgia, North Carolina, Florida. I still see them from time to time, not nearly as frequently as I did in the late 90s. I remember pondering this topic quite a bit back then. There were several different takes and what they actually are. Some are positing the contrails were an attempt to inoculate the population. Inoculation against what? Claims that the trails were poisoning the population. To curb growth. And others said it was a long-term weather modification program. I do have a recollection. While driving over a few hundred miles, I saw the grid of contrails in the sky. They literally blanketed the sky over the course of hours of my, my drive. I remember feeling concerned. I also remember a show featuring a witness to a cow being invisibly lifted over the tree line and out of sight. Again, I was instantly convinced this person calling Coast had seen an impossible event. And in my mind, it was as if I had seen it too. It sounds utterly ridiculous to me now. I remember enthusiastically telling some people about that call. Let's just say, despite my zeal for the story, they weren't really into the subject and had nothing to add. So I felt awkward for bringing it up. And soon as I had an actual career job, I never mentioned anything about my interests in these subjects again. I must be over that now. Y2K. I have to say, Art really did play this one up too. He dedicated a lot of airtime talking about the imposing threat of the looming year 2000 computer bug. He had to, reporting on possible impending disasters as part of his shtick. After the fact, when nothing actually happened, at 12.01 a.m., January 1st, 2000, nothing happened. Art tried to save face and said that by discussing all the possible catastrophes associated with this kind of event, people were able to take the appropriate steps. As a result, narrowly avoiding such a crisis, I remember being a little worried about it, but not really. I didn't have a lot to lose back then. Terrence McKenna. McKenna was a frequent guest on Coast. His conversations with Art were among some of my most favorite. I was a big fan of all his journeys and his experiments with theogens and theogens. In 2001, I began my adult life, so to speak. I suddenly became very busy, and of course my priorities changed. Needless to say, I couldn't stay up until the wee hours listening to Coast anymore. There wasn't a strong station nearby that carried it. Occasionally on clear nights, I could pick up a signal from a large station about 200 miles away. For your information, I do have several entire Coast to Coast AM programs on this YouTube channel. Transferred from cassette and uploaded a few years ago. Please take a look. Thank you so much. The quality of the recording is quite poor. 20-year-old transfers are not going to be pristine. 
I, I used to use my trusty Real Talk recorder to record a few shows a month and listen to them while I worked in my art studio. As my interest in Coast to Coast AM waned, one of the last topics I looked into were stories of white powder gold or monotonic gold. The supposed elixir of life. I followed Art through all of his on-again, off-again status throughout the late 90s and early 2000s. To this day, when I hear the Giorgio Moroder theme from Midnight Express, and of course the iconic Coast to Coast AM opening music, I still get this feeling of anticipation and excitement. Don't make me do the Bobby McFerrin. <laughs> McFerrin rendition of The Chase again. Please, nobody wants to hear that. Should I try to read this one like Ross Mitchell? My David Blaine was bad enough. There's honestly not a ton of information on Arthur William Bell III's early life. He wrote an autobiography in 98, The Art of Talk, which I haven't read but I'm assuming he fleshes out his early life and childhood. It's no longer in print, but you can find used copies, of course. I'm sure he had a typical upbringing, I guess. A mom, a dad, a sibling or two, elementary school, junior high, as people his age call it, high school. However, here at the beginning, there is some mystery. There may be a little mystery at the end, too. There is some dispute as to whether he was born in Jacksonville, North Carolina, or camp. Lejeune, North Carolina. In either case, he was born in 1945. He became intensely interested in radio when he was a boy. At 13, he received his license to become an amateur radio operator. Amateur radio operators, or hams as they're called, engage in two-way personal communications with other hams. The term ham was originally used as a joke, something derogatory. It is said that these amateur radio operators like to ham it up or they were being a hammy actor like a <laughs> like I am right now art could be hammy at times that's for sure but it comes with the territory and it was part of his charm as an amateur radio operator one receives a personal call sign art had several over his lifetime the final call sign he used for a long time was W6 OBB. There's no way I can do it like him. During the Vietnam War, Bell served as a medic in the Air Force. Continuing to follow his passion for radio, Bell and a friend broadcasted a pirate radio station from Amarillo Air Force Base. As a statement on his opinion of the war, Bell made a point in playing many anti war songs popular at the time. This was not in line with the policies of American Forces Network. AFN is a worldwide radio television broadcasting service that provides entertainment and information to American service members. Bell moved to the Japanese island Okinawa once his services in the military had ended. He got a job as a disc jockey at Japan's only English-speaking non-military radio station. While there, Bell set a Guinness World Record for longest solo broadcast. A marathon of music. At 116 hours and 15 minutes. Wow. The money raised by this stunt allowed Bell to charter a Douglas DC-8. The plane was then used to fly to Vietnam and rescue 130 orphans stranded in Saigon. All of these children were eventually adopted by U.S. families. I don't recall him ever talking about this period of his life on the show when I was listening. After returning to the U.S., Bell began studying engineering. He quickly realized the classroom was not for him and dropped out. Instead, he returned to radio as a chief engineer and board operator of a local station. But his big break didn't come until 1986 when KDWN station out of Las Vegas gave Art a five hour time slot. 
overnight. Bell continued to work as a disc jockey during this time before shifting completely over to talk. In 1978, Art had started a political call-in show called West Coast AM. In 1998, Art began broadcasting the show from his home in Pahrump, Nevada. Nye County, hence the Kingdom of Nye. And the show was renamed Coast to Coast AM after seven laborious years. In 1993, Bell began to syndicate his show, and the rest is history. Jesus. Apparently, the show's initial intent was to deal with subjects related to conspiracy theory and libertarian viewpoints. However, after the Oklahoma City bombings in 1995, the show was navigated away from these topics and into the subject matter Coast is best known for. As the popularity of the program grew exponentially, it was reported in June 1997 that Coast was broadcast on 460 stations. Shortly thereafter, at its peak, Coast was heard by 22 million listeners and was syndicated to 500 plus radio stations. All right, here we are. Uh, let's go back to it. Uh, whizzing around on the cycle uh, like a cowboy hanging on for dear life and underneath the 18-wheeler, uh, is that right? The fact that Art had no call screeners gave the show a great working without a net feel. I mean, Art was literally running the entire show out of his home after all. But not having those screeners as gatekeepers really gave the show the sense that anything could happen. For such a massive show that was reaching millions, not to have a screener should have been terrifying, not to art. The spontaneity, the element of surprise, was exactly what art and his audience craved. Where else could you hear time travelers and vampires on the same night? The Colin shows were often just as good as some of art's best guests. The Ghost to Ghost shows are a great example of this. Folks would call in from all over and sit around Art's radio campfire and tell their most frightening tales of the macabre. There are so many classic calls as a result, and a couple of them rise to the top. The caller that was on the run from government agents because he had some secret technological knowledge. He was in the middle of his convo with Art. Oh my God, Art. <laughs> <laughs> and suddenly the satellite broadcasting the show goes down. Also, the time the pilot called in from a small plane flying over Area 51. To get a closer look. Get shot down during the call. That was a doozy. Hey, y'all. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm flying, flying. I want to. I'm above Area 51, or I want to get a closer look. Three six one. It's not a good idea. Art's collection of bumper music was also very memorable. I always enjoyed his selections for bumpers. All of those years being a disc jockey in the 70s and 80s had honed his musical collection into nothing but his absolute favorites. He had even created his own custom versions of many of these songs. They were slightly out of phase. It gave them a really cool, sweeping effect. Coast to Coast made the news in relation to Hale Bob Comet in 1996, as I mentioned before. The story goes, an amateur astronomer, Chuck Schremack, in November of 1996, 
photographed the comet. According to him, the image appeared to show a fuzzy shape next to the comet. Actual astronomers at the time dismissed this image as fake. Later, they further explained that the object was actually an unidentified star, not cataloged by the sky viewing software that Shremek was using. Others claimed the photo was simply altered using Photoshop. However, this image was sent to Bell and the story was promptly presented to the Coast audience. Happening simultaneously to this astronomical event, the Heaven's Gate cult was nearing its 22-year run. Heaven's Gate was a UFO religious cult led by long-term leaders Marshall Applewhite, Doe, and Bonnie Nettles, T. The group latched on to the idea of a craft flying alongside the comet. In March 1997, the 39 members of the cult were found dead, having participated in a mass ritualistic suicide. The members believed they would be transported to the craft upon physical death. At the time, I was into astronomy. I had a telescope and was in a place in the world where I could see Hale Bob. I didn't have a very powerful telescope, so aside from looking at moon craters, glimpses of the striations of Jupiter, and invisibly distinguishing the rings of Saturn, Hillbop was the most exciting astronomical event since Halley's Comet. I wasn't a listener at the time, but I entered the Coast to Coast universe shortly thereafter because it was still a very popular topic. In February 1997, a man calling himself Mel Walters began calling into Coast to Coast AM, claiming to have a bottomless pit on his property. But of course, no evidence of the hole where Mel Walters has been found. Okay, here we go. Art originally retired from Coast in October 1998, but by the end of that same month, he had returned. I remember Hilly Rose and George Knapp being very entertaining substitutes for Art during this period. Art retired again in April of 2000. This is when Mike Siegel took over as primary host of Coast to Coast AM. Amazingly, Art returns February 2001 and is extremely displeased with the direction Siegel had taken his show. Siegel's Coast was very similar to Nori's Coast. Which ain't great. With Art's penultimate retirement in October 2002, George Nori Parsons Lowe, if you will, takes the role of Coast's main host with the help of Barbara Simpson and Ian Punnett. In September of 2003, Art once again returned at a limited capacity with duties as a weekend host. Finally, in July of 2007, Art Bell retired as host of Coast to Coast AM, the show he had created from the ground up. In September of 2013, Art Bell's Dark Matter on Sirius XM began airing. It was very short-lived, unfortunately, because six weeks later, the show was ending production. I didn't have Sirius XM at the time. Just as an aside, I've also heard Don Ecker state that not only did Art rip his original format off, but he used the name Dark Matter outright, even though Ecker was already using the name Dark Matter and had made Art aware of the fact. Just another tidbit. Just another tidbit. Midnight in the Desert was another failed attempt at reigniting the coast flames. The first show aired in July of 2015, and the show ended in December of the same year. I don't think I was even aware of this show until it was already over. I'll briefly touch on some of Bell's other accomplishments and accolades. In 2008, he was inducted into the National Radio Hall of Fame. He also wrote several books, The Art of Talk, 1996, The Quickening, 1997, The Source, 99, The Edge, 99, co-written with Whitley Strieber, and The Coming Global Superstar, also written in 1999. I recently found an interview where Bell and Strieber were promoting The Coming Global Superstorm. They appeared on the Today Show, being interviewed by Matt Lauer. Not a meteorologist. 
not a meteorologist, not a climatologist, Absolutely. but informed amateur to avoid. Not a climatologist, no, nor you. Absolutely not. So, not sure. where do you base this information? They didn't take any of Lauer's pompous, smug questioning. It's so funny how Bell and Streber are just cold, cold chilling, slouching on the couch. For some reason, that crack. <laughs> for some reason, that cracked me up. They remind me of baby. <laughs> they remind me of babies. The movie The Day After Tomorrow was based on their book, The Coming Global Superstorm. I haven't seen it. It looked like just another disaster movie to me. Let me focus on Streber for just a second. Within the first week of Listening Coast, I was made aware that Art had a spin-off weekend show called Dreamland. Dreamland. It's the edge of the world. Art was still hosting at that time, and Streber took on the duties of the show a little later. I'll just say this. Back when I was enjoying the show, Art's wife, Ramona, was certainly a huge part of his life, as were his cats. Ramona would even get on the air with Art from time to time. You could tell how much they loved each other. It was really comforting to me back then. In the end, Coast to Coast AM wasn't really about Art. It was much more about the community he created. Although it was very clear he simply enjoyed talking, and radio gave him that perfect platform for his talents. He loved what he did, and he was a master at it. Sadly, Art passed away on April 13th, 2018, due to an accidental drug overdose. He apparently had taken several strong pain medications at once. I remember him speaking of a fall from his radio tower injuring his back years before. Rest in peace, Art. This is interesting. But not surprising. People are now making pilgrimages to see the resting place of Art Bell. Seems like a fitting tribute. He was uh, very known to, he liked Asian and, you know, that type of look for a woman, I guess. But Who now lives and broadcasts from Art's famous compound in Pahrump? He had sold the K N Y E station back in 2008, and apparently he gave Heather Wade, his protege, the guest house in 2018. That whole compound vibe of his property was never something I could I could relate to. Anyhow, thank you so much for listening. Till next time, this is Bill. A deep dive. No. This has been Diving Deep with Art Bell.